um, just about nine years with the help of uh, other community leaders from the surrounding neighborhoods that we all came together. And we created the Alliance for Sana, which is Savannah Healthy Neighborhoods Alliance. And to actually have the little cutting nine years later, there were 18 of community groups. This is a picture, this is great memories when we used to have our big meetings at the old Cypress Street Fire Station. As you can see, we have a uh, great apartment, which you guys can see. Um, so many of those uh, neighborhood residents still live in the same neighborhood. We don't tell them any we don't the movies at the Cypress Street Fire Station anymore because it was these two rebuilding together. So for a few years later, um, the association was dormant. And myself, along with two other community members, reactivated the neighborhood association, I believe, in 2013. And we started having our meetings at the Roosevelt School, which is close to Holiday and Children's. One of the um, <laughs> One of the first community events that I um, coordinated it was in 2003. That particular event, we had it on Orange Avenue, it's from Orange to Pine Street, where we have um, Orange Street Close. And um, we had different um, groups with resources and dancers from the community. I felt um, either people like the good organization from I would like them over and come to our new association. We had local Sarana. It was a new cleanup and we did along with ABC and what we call the Year Academy. It's a charter school located um, on our new association. As you can see in the middle, the lady that's singing the recording, that's my new son of the new. And the others are um, two people who came from different organizations and we did a cleanup. This is uh, the park. So this is one was a dream, and then it became a reality. And we have different pictures. This is the old Cypress Street Fire Station. That at the top photo, you can see that how it was. Cypress um, Street Fire Station is station number four. On the bottom, you can see the current um, station that is right now. Um, Myself, along with other community members who joined the efforts a few days later in 2016, tried to serve and serve the Cypress Street Fire Station. And thank God we were we raised the seat. And soon we're going to have the battle program, the Chief of Police, and a few weeks that's going to come and have um, it's arts and um, tutoring for the kids after school. We're also going to provide seniors with events. And, and the Cypress Street Fire Station is also going to be a community center, which currently it has been um, approved. We're looking forward to the grand opening. So I hope that all of you could come and join us and see what a uh, great benefit will be for our neighborhood. This is another event that I helped coordinate and put together, which was along the bike trail. It was another resource fair, and we were able to get lots of different prices from the different businesses around the area. We donated uh, uh, like gift cards and bicycles, and it was very surplus. The reason why we do these types of events about bringing the resources to the community is because a lot of people don't have access to technology, so it's better to bring the resources to them and that way they know more about it, um, or otherwise they don't take advantage of what's available. Some of the items that we have worked on getting in a bike trail, we've got the new trash cans, the you know, the picture to the right left, that's the old trash can, and the second right is the brand new trash can. Uh, they also, the city also replaced the LED lights, and um, in, our bike trail is kept clean. This is um, the most recent event that I planned to put together. This one was called the first annual concert at the Pacific, and it's called the Pacific Park. We wanted to make it so people who participated in the concert were our residents. So our residents uh, sang and they danced, and we had uh, Ms. Uh, Irma Macias. She sung beautiful at the concert. And we also had uh, 
other members in the community participate. We had um, Phil Nelita and Mr. Lucaria who came over to share that with you. And I would like to invite the residents to come and join our neighborhood meetings. And the next um, neighborhood meeting would be December 13th at uh, 6 p.m. and also the Walker Community Center. So I look forward to getting more people involved so we can continue to do wonderful things for our community. Thank you. Oh, our neighborhood is from First and McFadden and May to Thank you for the presentation. Our, our second neighborhood is actually down south of my next couple of woods, south coast. And we have uh, Aldo Buscati with us. And he's, I got a hard time talking to him. <laughs> That's a hard thing to follow. <laughs> I'm not as fancy, I don't have video. Um, but my name is Aldo Buscati. I do represent the uh, south coast uh, neighborhood. Um, we're located uh, on the north side along Dyer to Bristol on the um, east, down into Park MacArthur and Bono Corral uh, Park uh, on the south, and Flower on the east. So Bristol, Bristol on the west. Um, we have roughly about four, uh, 1,100 homes, uh, 4,000 residents, about 53% owner occupied. So we do have a lot of uh, renters within our community. Um, we are, oh, a little bit of myself, um, I've been a resident of Santa Ana for 50 years. I have lived in uh, that area uh, practically all my life. I went to Washington, back in the South of Africa, so I graduated from so a long time resident of Santa Ana. Our, our neighborhood association works a little bit different than most of them. We don't have a president, vice president type um, hierarchy. We do, we have a committee. We have about uh, seven people that participate. Uh, we're all equals, and we try, you know, to do everything together. Um, the recent game a couple of years ago, we did have the hierarchy, and the main person decided to move out of state, and we kind of lost everything. Uh, having to do with the association, uh, you know, contacts, phone numbers, everything. So we had to start from scratch. Um, so it's kind of a little bit tougher for us right now. Uh, right before COVID, uh, we got started having meetings again. We had to have for a while. Uh, but then COVID came, so we were down. Now we're starting again. We just recently had a big meeting at Saddleback High School um, with the Santa Ana PD, Orange County Sheriff. Uh, Councilman Correa, uh, school board uh, was there. Um, yes, but uh, it was a big thing uh, because we having a lot of issues with the water channel, the flood channel uh, flows. Uh, that's right now our main concern. We have a lot of homeless people living there. We have a lot of drug sales and usage, and they keep coming into our neighborhood. Uh, so we're working with the city, we're working with the uh, county in trying to see what we can do to solve it. Uh, it's not an easy job. Uh, they keep coming back. Uh, and the biggest problem is that the main camp that they have is right across the street from the in the media and it's out of that high school. So those kids get to see that. Every day. Uh, sometimes we see people shooting up like they're on the bike trail right across the street from the schools. Um, and it's not accepted for anybody in our neighborhood. Um, yeah, we reach out and hopefully we get some help. Um, the other thing that we're pretty excited about is the new um, stadium that's being built uh, inside of that. Uh, that's going to be really, really but uh, it'll improve our area. We'll, we'll have a lot of uh, events there. Um, and of course, uh, thanks for the 
is not the It's a support of next year. It will be very excited about that. That's pretty much it. <laughs> um, you didn't tell them that that stadium was being the funds came from an alumni of right. Saddleback, no city right. funds whatsoever. Correct. And it's like four million dollars. Yeah, it was an alumna that actually uh, came to play play football, uh, and he funded the uh, the stadium. I also want to mention that stadium. This is the power of the neighborhood association. It was put in the back by the by the pathway, and it was really been a nuisance to a lot of neighbors. We were talking to school board back and forth. They worked in agreement, and it's now moved more on the buyer, which we're not going to bother with those neighbors. But see the neighborhood association that that got to have. That's what we have to do. This is one thing that uh, Al and I are talking about also, just in case you guys have that. Expect the south side of the city to go through a major explosion in three years. They're going to take the parking, the uh, shopping area, ordered by Bristol, MacArthur, Sunflower, and Plaza. Knock all those buildings down, and put in 3,700 apartments, a 250 story per, or senior center, and 200. Room hotel along with retail. So we've been working with the developers. He's kind of talked to us now. We okay, are feeling what we want. But we also have heard now the Sears Club is going to be doing some things in the village. And fortunately, they reached out and we talked to them shortly about it. And then I also heard that they're going to build Sears Court, which is Bristol, Sunflower. Added to if you've ever been down in Flower, that way it's Sunflower. How many rooms is going in? That, that, Know how many apartments are on I'm not sure, but it looks like it's a large mass of big open space. So, the south part of the city is going to explode with new apartments, and they're all being leased. They're all going to be sold. They're all expensive. They're all expensive. But <laughs> we're so early in the phase, no one can tell us what they're going to rent for. And no one can tell us how many rooms they're going to be. And it's, it's very interesting to get in here early planning of this, but it is going to have something. We hope the apartment will let the neighbors that are staying stay involved. Okay, with that, I'm going to have a Rosa. You're going to need uh, This is my buddy, ex council person. And her and I go back way back. So she's been very active with the college. And the college has been in a very generous time with us, but other people in the city, other neighborhood associations. So she's going to talk about a, a bond issue. Me. She's, going say, <laughs> she's going to say a few words, and she promises to keep it short. I do. I do. I, I think I can. You can hear me, right? You can hear the recording. Oh, sorry about that. But I can't stand over here, right? <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, I am on the South Santa Ana College Foundation Board. And back in November 6, 2012, we came to you to say, Community, if you support us for the general obligation bond for $198 million, we are going to provide you with top quality education facility. Well, guess what? You've invested in us, and we have completed that bond and bringing all of what we said we were going to do, just to let you know what we promised you. Number one, was a state-of-the-art uh, institution in spaces, uh, the new Johnson Center student. If you haven't been on the college and saw that, it's unbelievable. In addition to the culinary arts running the cafe, it is phenomenal, and the food is great. Everything is, hand, um, is from fresh, nothing frozen over there. In addition, we told you that we were going to do a center plan of infrastructure. We provided with you not only the buildings for, for science, technology, which is top. You haven't been to our science building, go over there. Uh, 
health and science, which is going to be completed in, uh, in April, April 2023. That's going to house nursing, that's going to house uh, pharmacology, pharmacy, <laughs> okay, in addition to EMT training, in addition to that. In addition, we provided that hardscape for the plaza. In addition, if you haven't been to the amphitheater and been to any of the concerts, you need to be here on that. So with that, we completed the expenditures of that $198 million bond uh, Thursday. We had our last oversight committee for Mentor Q. And on that committee, in addition to me representing the foundation. Can I ask you one quick question? My wife and I are new to this. Are we talking about Santa Ana College or Santa Ana? Where, where, where Santa Ana. facility are we talking about? Santa Ana. Right. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. I, I know there's different satellites, but I didn't know exactly. No, Santa Ana satellite high school. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank In addition, you. Drew Hatcher, who is the chair, represented the business organization. He now, uh, Emma uh, Marcinas, she was the community at large. Cecilia Aguinaldo, uh, senior citizen organization. Me was Santa Ana College Foundation. Paul Gonzalez, community at large. Ken Wen, uh, community at large. Barbara Walker, Teresa Salovar, and Marta Girate. That's what's your oversight committee. And we made sure that this sheet here, which is a spreadsheet for every expenditure, got to 100%. Okay, on that. So we want to thank you once and all. We promise you what we were going to do with those funds. If you, you know, supported us with this general obligation bond, and guess what? It's out there. You need to go on that campus because when you step on that campus, it says success begins there. Why that is so important to let you know out of 116 community college, Santa Ana College now is ranked two. We're right behind Mount Sac. We are the only college out of that 116 that have. Um, double digit enrollment, everybody else is negative. We have over 46,000 students attending this jewel here in Santa Ana. So you should be very proud of it. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. The one thing you just mentioned, just right over there in Bristol in 17, is the planetarium. And I took a couple of nephews there before we shut down the fortune of the coast. And now they're scheduled to reopen it now. And uh, two dollars, what a great place. And the person curating running it is from NASA. And she did an excellent job, star formation, what have you. I was totally, totally blown away by the planetarium. So well, the planetarium is closed right now yes. <laughs> due to COVID. Yeah. We shut it shut down because of COVID. And all of our um, um, professors that were running that planetarium retired. So we're hiring. <laughs> we are hiring uh, on, on, on at the, before the, so we hope to have it open soon, very soon sometime. So uh, any, any retired scientists, <laughs> please apply, okay. <laughs> As I mentioned, the college has been very helpful. We, in fact, had our awards meeting there last year. Um, just recently, there was another presentation. And the Code Enforcement Community Workshop was fires in back. It's going to be held on November 3rd and 10th. And they're asking for people who, who want to be educated as far as what code, what code enforcement provides within the community. So if anyone there is interested in knowing what they do in do for your neighborhood, I suggest you sign up and, and attend the community workshop. Uh, again, number third is uh, 8, uh, 8.30, is that? No, I'm sorry, 6 to 8.30. And on the third and the campus, as well as our flyers in, uh, in back. 
Some of us like to copy and cook these guys and have a note to say thank you. Frank, where are you? Frank, who uh, are you? Where did you go? You did, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, we're going to go now into our main topic, and it's to talk about homeless. We're very happy to have folks we have here from the city to talk about. It. We have legal representative, and we also have PD uh, representative. Uh, just like to remind everybody, you know, conduct yourself in a civil manner. Uh, uh, and uh, that you go through and raise your hands, we'll answer all the questions that are out there. Uh, out there. But these are the people that are trying to do things for us, and uh, answer every help us. Uh, Imagine we will introduce our path. Okay. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, we have from our police department who is going to be talking about uh, homeless. Uh, homeless here is uh, Montiel. Did you do that right? Okay. I think my son, I think it was a Montiel when I was teaching modern day, was, he's in the department. <laughs> Why was there an agent? Well, then maybe you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just a How do you know? I don't want to My son is on the room. Caesar, Richard, Victor, me. Somebody's a Marty, right? Is a Marty? Yeah. Junior? I have a son that's a junior Marty. I went to Monday, I went to Monday. Sorry, sir, like the fans. Monday, right here. Thank you. My wife went to Monday. I went to my cousin. Can I, can I say something about modern day? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Modern day is now dual enrollment at Santa Ana College. Yes. So what does that tell you once again about Santa Ana College? They are participating in our dual enrollment program. Incredible school. My oldest friend was the very first graduating class in 1953. My father helped. Shoot, you're going to do a writing here just now. My father was responsible for getting a man to put my name on the whole farm country back in there before 1950 and 1949. So uh, he knew the farmer who owned it, which was Platinum, because that big house is still on Edinger now, kind of owns up there. That was the plan, and that was the plan of the farm. He's there. My dad, that was one of my dad's clients. His dad was a tractor mechanic and his own business. And so he knew that uh, Father Brady was the one from St. Anne's uh, Catholic Church there who ran the Commodus of the him. And uh, he was going to order there getting people to pledge $50. Boy, they were going to back in 1950. <laughs> and uh, then he got a hold of uh, Platinum, he was the Platinum, and they got a hold of uh, the Diocese, which was in Los Angeles at the time. And my dad was just my money when he didn't have property for them. So my granddaughter is a freshman and she's in the choir with uh no, no, no our granddaughter. <laughs> 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 It's all world, isn't it? Really? Yes. Uh, then next, next, we have um, Commander. Okay, this is uh, Marty. Yes. And he is going to do the PAL program, P A A L. Should be up to here. Yeah, it should be free. You got a St. John Bosco graduate coming to the PAL? <laughs> 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 Okay, from the city attorney's office, we have Mr. Jose Montoya. 
She's going to come up here and tell us what is legal and what is not legal for our officers to do about the homeless people. Okay. So you want to get as long as you want to ask for security. Well, I put you on your computer. Yes, sir. Anywhere. Oh, my goodness gracious. Where'd you go? In the South of Detroit. In the South. In the South. In Detroit. Okay, I don't know if you want to gentlemen to make an opening statement, but basically what we've asked them to do is tell us what you can and cannot do as far as for yourselves. A lot of times our hands are tied by state, they can or cannot do. And to us it's very easy to just, you know, rest your way out of it. Well, it doesn't work that way. So Jimmy, you want to make a statement, right? So this one. Let's start with just doing a little introduction. Uh, my name is Sergeant Montiel. I've been with the Santa Ana Police Department going on almost 27, 27 years. So I've been here a long time. I remember when Alberta was one of our council members back in the, back in the day, we like to say, police department. But for the last six years, in, in 2016, I was kind of all of home people with the Civic Center when we had all the homeless people in the Civic Center. So we went through all the phases of what we can and we can't do legally in the civic center when it comes to removing the homeless and kind of clean it up to the civic center like it was today. Uh, we work very closely with the city attorney's office in, in coming up with municipal codes and, and, and following their guidance on you know, what we can do with property, what we can do when it comes to shelters, because there's federal case law out there that kind of navigates or tells us what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do and enforcing stuff. Um, when the service center cleared out, I was fortunate enough to get promoted and I sent back to patrol. And the chief decided he wanted to make this big 10 man homeless team citywide. So the chief all told me again to come back and work homelessness. Now I supervise what's called our, our quality of life team. So some of them have been to some of your community needs before. If you hear, hear the acronym COLT, that's what COLT is. And we basically work for an interdepartmental team between the police department, code enforcement, public works, parks and rec, city attorney's office, CDA, you name it. We're all involved in, 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 uh, in dealing with the homeless issues that we have here in our city. Um, so we've been doing that since 2018. We're still doing it in 2022. Believe it or not, uh, you guys are all getting mad at me when I say this, but our homeless population has decreased significantly. Right now, we are dealing with the, the uh, I would say the most service resistant of service resistant. So these are the ones that it, it appears like there's more, but these ones are just more in your face. The ones that are, have mental health issues, have addiction issues. And right now we're working to, to, uh, to get them where they need, but because of issues with the county and the state, there's very little resources for them right now. The resources they do have are very, very short term. So, but I'll answer questions once I go over all of the industry stuff. So. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Montoya. I am the Assistant City Attorney. I've been with the office almost three years now. Um, I prim primarily advise uh, the planning department, but more specifically uh, the code enforcement department. And I also serve as the city prosecutor. So when individuals are cited by the San Ana Police Department, um, I am the one that files the cases in court um, over here at Central Court. Good evening. My name is Commander Joe Morgan. I ladder to the San Ana Police Department in 2004 from my hometown, the city of Montebello, where I was an officer for six years, born and raised. Uh, this has been an unbelievable city to work for and work with. I currently uh, am in charge of the Community Engagement Division. Within that division, it consists of the CAL program, which one of our residents touched on, and I'll touch on that uh, in a few. Uh, I also have our Family Justice Center, which is located uh, just above our lobby here in the police department, where we offer services A through Z. And what that means is anything from restraining order assistance to assisting special victims, victims of very violent uh, special crimes, uh, issuing them social services, counseling, things of that nature. Again, a, a one-stop shop, A through Z, uh, a 
amazing center that's, that's been with us since 2018. Uh, I currently oversee the community engagement team that's responsible for putting on a lot of our community engagement events ranging from uh, donuts with dispatch, coffee with a cop, uh, trunk or treats, uh, a lot of the different uh, community events that we do citywide all year long, including our open house. Uh, we've partnered with many of your neighborhood association groups uh, to put on these events. Um, so my team is busy every single day, every single week, putting on these, these events uh, and do just a tremendous job. Let's see what else I mean. I also oversee our West End substation uh, on the west side of town. Uh, uh, we do that in Harbor Boulevard. Um, and I also oversee our school resource officer program. Uh, and what else do I oversee? Our Explore program, our chaplains program. We have a very robust chaplains program that gets requested on calls for service. And these, these chaplains are, are trained to where they go and they offer comfort uh, to people that have been victimized to crimes. Uh, not at every call for service, but when, when there is a request, we do our best to dispatch all our chaplains. And also, uh, lastly, our youth program, which is our Explore program. Our Explore program, which I'm happy to, to say that I was at least explore from age 14 and a half to 19. Um, it's, it's a great program for our youth that have interest in becoming uh, law enforcement officers, law enforcement dispatchers. Um, it's a great program during that age, during the high school years, uh, to be able to explore the field of law enforcement to see if it's in fact something that they want to do. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, one of the biggest programs we put on, and we're actually in our last week, of graduation is coming up next Wednesday night, our Community Police Academy. Okay, I see a, I see a candidate, I see a student in second class there, and it's really a great program. It's basically to give you guys the opportunity to, to, to show you what your police department is all about. Okay, when I, when I stress your, because we are your police department, we belong to you, and without your assistance, uh, we would be successful in, in fighting crime and being able to do the things that we do. So thank you for that. But it's an 11 week program that, that we put you through. Sometimes we put you literally in the boots of officers uh, through scenarios, uh, how it is to try to pull somebody over and get some resistance in terms of lack of cooperation. We had the airship land and the students got to get inside and look at the airship. Uh, we were giving the instructions on CSI investigations, investigations from auto theft to homicide investigations to everything, everything that we can show you how we do, why, and where we do it. So at the end, it's our hope that at the end of the program, that you have a different perspective and you have a deeper understanding of what your police department does and why. You know, as opposed to, we, we ask a lot of the different questions at the front end, and by the end, it's, it's unbelievable how perspectives are changed because of the experience we provide. That's me in a nutshell. Sorry for talking too much. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I have a, can you all hear me? <laughs> I have a question here. Before I left, a friend of mine called me up and she wanted me to ask uh, the police department about the city net. Can you tell us about that? Uh, it has to do with. Uh, First, I, she said that when they come out, it has to do with homeless, when people on the streets wondering what they're doing there. Uh, she said that they come out in a private car. They, they spend about 45 minutes with the people. They work from 7 in the morning till 9 in the, in the evening. And they're what, seven days a week, and they're wondering uh, how much of this do the taxpayers have to pay for the net program. That's a good question. So, When I was in the Civic Center, Sydney has been a part of, uh, they're basically an outreach uh, company or organization the city contracts with to go do outreach for, like, with the homeless. Um, I guess the kind of the understanding is, is that, you know, we, we can take these individuals to jail over and over again. It, it, it doesn't work, right? That was, the, that was the past. That was the model in the past. 
I'm not going to tell you that some people need to go to jail because, and that's just because they're homeless. It, it does them a big, uh, uh, a better service if we find them the resources they need, whether it's shelter, housing in the long term, mental health, you name it. So sitting it does, the, it, it takes the outreach out of the arms of the police officer and it puts it in social workers where it should be. So we have contracted with CityNet. Their, their uh, contracts up for renewal, I think, at the end of this year. And they respond to any call for service related to homelessness that doesn't provide or doesn't pose a safety, safety risk to them. Because these are your you know, 19, 20, 22 year old uh, young male, female social workers. So we're not going to put them in harm's way. They work directly with underneath and, and, uh, and the CDA department here at the, at the city. And if my officer go out and contact an individual that's homeless and is asking for help or requesting help, we can sit here and help them do the outreach. They can offer them everything from just a DMV voucher to go get their ID because you can't get resources with your actual ID, to putting them into a shelter. We even offer transportation to send you back home if you're from out of state. Or for another county person. And then he wants to respond when you use the FCDF? Yeah? Yes. So if you if you have access to the My Santa Ana app, it's old because there's two there's two tabs when it's related to homelessness. There's homeless encampments where you see the big homeless encampment. My team will mostly respond to them will pick sitting there with us. But there's also a tab just for homeless outreach. And so if you just see the individual <laughs> sitting on the corner, maybe he's asking for money or he's in a center meeting. You don't really want him to have police contact, which I agree with, right? You can get a hold of city net through that app. You can app it and they'll respond to it. They'll, they respond to the calls for service. So if you call the police department and say you have an issue with a homeless individual and you don't want the police involved, they'll transfer you over to city net's dispatcher. They have their own dispatch to And the city net social workers will go to calls for service and they'll get done by the police and they'll go to the social workers. Um, you can be holding through the app, you can get hold through my cold team, and you can get hold through your own dispatch. They have a direct public line for you guys to access. I called them twice because I called the police department first for homeless front guys that were laying on the sidewalk on 17th and Bristol from Santa Ana College. And they waited there for over 45 minutes and nobody showed up. So, a lot of times, uh, people fall through the cracks, they don't do it. I'm not saying that they don't respond to all the calls, but sometimes the police doesn't do it because you refer me to them, then I refer, then I go back to you because nobody shows up. So, and, uh, but just so you know that we do have these problems, that it's not cut and dry, or it's no, not no, running no, smooth, nothing, okay? nothing with sitting there or with us is black and white, right? There, they're taking on a greater burden of handling our calls when it comes to homelessness. But what they're also having is they're having staffing issues like everybody else. It's like how many people want to come work with homeless people as a, for a living as a social worker? I don't think it was. But it, if you could, if they can at least say, listen, we got three other calls, we can't get there. Yeah. You know, we know it wasn't an emergency, but the guy's laying on the sidewalk with people trying to get up, you know, the women or their children trying to get uh, sit in the bus. Uh, shelter so they can wait for the bus and this guy's in the way in the way there and he looks intimidating. Yeah. So here's so here's the deal saying if you can ask them where you are and let's say a queue in the list of, of responses. Um, but you don't have to go with city, right? If, if you're not in the shuttle people in here that just you know you call say hey, I don't want city I want officer to talk to that that individual. And you can you can go that route also which is from a lot of people in the community that don't want We'd rather try the social work side of it first. Um, if you're not, call back. You know, throw my name out. Hey, Sergeant Montel told me to call you and see what, what your ETA is to respond to this stuff. A lot of times, if they can't make it, they will reach out to my team and we'll try to get out there and, and deal with it. But I know for a fact they do respond to all of them. The time frame, I can't, I can't tell you that. Yes, sir. Um, I, have, I have a family friend. Who's uh, she? She's a young, actually working on a PhD. She's a social worker, and she works for CityNet. Was in San Diego for several years. She's now in another city, 
But I asked her when I learned what she was doing. I said, well, so what are you doing? What's your experience? She said, there's tremendous waste of resources. Tremendous. And so I guess my question is, with their, with their contract coming up here at the end of the year, how is that being vetted to, to try to ferret out where the waste is? And is there someone else who can do it better? Because, you know, I mean, these stories that you hear, they're all over town. Everybody in this room probably can tell you two or three stories of when they call PD and, oh, we're going to send out city net and nobody ever shows up. So clearly, there's not enough resources. They can't get it done. And neither can the police department, apparently. And um, it's it's causing a lot of, as you know, that's why this tonight's focus for this meeting is on homelessness. It's a number one problem in the city, and it's feeding so many other things. Um, we all know people have moved out of town because they're sick and tired of it. Can't do this entire. Uh, we all have friends that have moved out. We're here because we still believe in San but everybody's sick and tired of the excuses. And uh, everything else is like somehow somebody's got to take control and get uh, get rid of the waste, make it more effective, um, make some commitments at work that if I got a city city that can't show up, that we're going to send a police officer and someone's going to be there in 15 minutes or whatever. It's just you know the excuses have gone on too long. I'll be honest with you. I would agree and disagree with you because for the waste that people say is going on with City Net, if there was this is the lady that works for it. No, I understand that. And I would like that lady to come talk to me what waste is, right? Because I've worked homelessness in the city for six years, right? I've been part of this. I've seen the home, I saw it with the homelessness explode when, when, when the courtyard first opened and stuff like that. I, I think it's people need to grasp when it comes to homelessness that even City Net and that's the police department. Are limited on what we can do because the not not the city's resources, right? It, it's very frustrating that a police department's uh, side when you when you arrest an individual, this one you messed up, and that individual's out of jail before you write your report because laws have changed in the city. Um, you take an individual to the hospital to be 5150, who's having a severe mental health issue, and he gets released within one or two hours of leaving a prescription. He's not going to fill because he has a mental health issue, or they give him some meds, and they said he walks out. There's no, you know, less than probably 10 years ago, if you arrest an individual for narcotics, he was forced to go to some type of rehab program. Now you get more of a penalty for running a red light than you do for possession of narcotics. So these individuals that were contacted are going through revolving door over and over and over again. But we're not. Not us, not the city. My, my opinion is the state and the county aren't providing the resources when it comes to mental health and drug rehab for these individuals. Because these are individuals I've dealt with for 20 years and I've been here. You know, they were ministers like I was in the city. You know, and, 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 and you have a, a very dedicated group of officers in the city that I supervise. Do everything they can to help out these individuals with the resources that we have available to us. The same with sitting there. Sitting that staff do sitting there because they're frustrated, because no matter how much they offer, the core of this causing this illness is not we don't have the resources for it. That, that's what the problem is right now. Everybody talks about housing. It's great to house an individual. If you house an individual with mental health or drug addiction problems, you're setting them up for failure until he gives those resources. That's why the city's great. We're building permanent supportive housing everywhere. We're building housing units that have social workers on site in these individuals to teach them how to live because something failed in their system when they were 10 years old. Nobody taught them to give us Western, you know, holy work, pay a bill, wash your room. We, our city's building incredible units given those resources. Um, we recently had a, a Zoom meeting with uh, Jesse Lopez and a gentleman who explain the cult quality of life. Um, you can hear me. Um, quality of life. Too. And we asked, that was our main reason for speaking. I don't know if this is on. But anyway. 
So um, the point I'm making is we either, it seemed like resources were definitely, thank you, definitely the problem, resources. I asked about shelters. So there was one run by the county, more like a warehouse kind of situation. You couldn't stay there during the day? You didn't come in back in the evening? No, so. Or maybe I misunderstood that. And then we talked about another, another shelter that is run by the city, I believe, and that is more of a offering all the services and that sort of thing. And it's so 200 beds, maybe? So, you know what I mean? I don't know who talked to you because I read that whole thing. So, Just a little bit. No, 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 no that was yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know that was they were they were very informative and very helpful in letting us know what they were trying to do. So that was helpful, but it sounds like there's nowhere not only to house these individuals, but to give them the sources they need. So we have because I'm tired of it too. I feel the same way the city Santa, there's a county and it's heartbreaking. There's a full-time shelter in San Ana run by the county, which has a <laughs> full capacity of stuff. 425 beds. I think their population right now, I think I told me this morning, was 364. But they haven't opened up the pool. They haven't opened up the pool 425 beds. The city of Santa Ana runs a 200 bed shelter off of Carnegie mm -hmm. and Pullman. Um, we're at about 150 individuals there, so we have 50 open spaces there. That, that's, and, that's right. I missed yeah, that. That's and we're, and we're expanding to be 25 to 50. Okay. But the, the city, not the city, the county, Every year opens up what's called the cold weather shelter. That's the one they run the far way down the water. They wanted to run a third guard field this year, but the city fought back and they're not going to run it there. The judge changed his mind. He's going to now let it reopen at the armory or water. Okay. And that cold weather shelter serves the entire county. The That's judge. one of the reasons that I'm here. Sorry to interrupt you, but you know, one of the reasons I'm here today is why should the city of Santa Ana? Beat the dumping site for all the homeless. We need to have our city council and those who are in the office. We need to put more time with the city council to sue the county, to continue to sue them for South County or other places to have the homeless. We should not be picking all the dump site, having all these people here. Our kids get out of school. Every every walkway, every pathway when the kids elementary junior high and high school get out, we are the ones, our kids are the ones that are facing those homeless people all the time, just like he, this man brought up early. And our councilman and hopefully our, our district attorney will continue to fight. We need to sue the county to have it somewhere else. I, I'm, I'm not saying anything bad about the city, uh, the PD. I know you're trying. I know there's a lot of uh, things behind that your hands are tied at, uh, at times, but we're all frustrated. We're all frustrated. And I, I'm all for helping the homeless, but we have a lot of drug addicts that are filtering in, in between them and a lot of mental people that need the assistance. So let me, let me ask, let me ask this question. The city has sued 34 cities. Do you want to comment on We need to continue. Uh, yes, that was, that was uh, before my time, but yes, we, we have sued the city and um, the county, the county and, and, and several cities. Um, and we completely, um, the city has continued to fight. I mean, we felt the, the shelter, um, and then we, we stopped it from opening there. We, we sued the Salvation Army, um, and then now, you know, our hands were tied with the court, basically, basically issued this order. Um, but we are, we are fighting, and we do share your frustration. So, I, trust me, I'll wait because for this is why I cut this for, for your experiences, I imagine a tenfold which my house is dealing with every day, right? So, we, 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 we fought. I mean, when I found out the cold weather shelter was going to open up at the Salvation Army and every army, I called every community leader I knew from that area to let them know hey, you got to report to the county, you got to explain to the county. We did, we did report. I remember listening. Don't get me wrong, but I like to go play my, my penny slots, right? But I kind of counsel my children. I had to be a federal court everybody right? to go sit there and fight this thing. And it was devastating when a week later the federal judge decides to declare a weather emergency in Southern California and allow the cold weather shelter. Now, I'm crossing my fingers that the county doesn't find an operator to run that cold weather shelter. Because that cold weather shelter, just so you guys are aware of the way it's run in the past, and you guys need to be vocal about this to the county. Is that it'll accept 
anybody from anywhere. Right now, in order to get into the county shelter, the full time county shelter on the Illinois, and to get in your Carnegie, you have to be screened. You can't have any outstanding felony warrants. You can't be a sex offender. This cold weather shelter that they open up every single year in this county does not screen you for felony warrants, any violence, and they don't check to see if you're sex registered. As long as you make the bus at 6 to the flower at 5 o'clock in the evening, they will take you there, which is right next to Del High Park in a school. And then they bring you back in here to the center at 6 o'clock in the morning the next day. And for 12 to 14 hours, what do those individuals do in our city? They wander. It took me years to get to the center. There's nobody more invested in keeping this area clean than I am. So it's devastating when modern day Bosco was having the tailgate down there that one day. I stopped and I talked to this one individual, and he's a sex registered out of Cyprus, and he's just sitting in San Diego waiting for the cold weather shelter to open down a morning. You know, and it's his parole agent's in right. He's probably in Cyprus and he's sitting in San Diego. So y'all need to be I will support you 100 percent on this because we have to, we, we have we have been. The push where are you going to send your homes to? We'll send them to San Diego. You know I mean, I've been here the history when the courtyard first opened, I experienced the whole thing, and it was meant to be just for the civic center, and then it became dumping ground to clear the river bed, to clear every other county issue that we have. It's horrible, and I, and I get you guys' frustration, right? But this city, we go to training classes and we talk to people from all around the county, right? They wish, they pray. That's if they have a city stand and a place towards homelessness. Now, is it enough? No, right? But we also have other things we need to attend to. It's, it's, it's tough right now, very tough. But to say that we're not trying and we're not succeeding, I'm going to argue with you that, but we'll agree to disagree because the population has gone down over 50%. But like I said earlier, the ones that we're having are the most service resistant. They're the ones that have mental health issues where there's no resources for them. The ones that have severe drug addiction, there's no resources for them. Resources. They go to jail, they're out within a half an hour with a ticket in their hand. They never show up to Where would their resources come from? If there were resources, where would that come from? The county, the state, the county, county provides the okay. state. You okay. have, you know, we, we, we talked about the old Fairview institution there mm -hmm. on Coast Mesa, right? From what I understand, by law, that place has to be ready and maintained in case of emergency. There were a thousand beds for mental health patients over there. They refused to help. They refused the state refused to open. Right? I guess they're gonna sell it for housing. That's devastating. We don't need housing. Housing doesn't do anybody good if, if, if people with mental health, health issues right. don't get those mental health issues, set them up for failure. Yeah. Right? They're gonna get evicted. Yeah. That's why we I mean, don't know how many housing units we have, three, four, five. They provide social workers on site to make sure that these people succeed. When they're in our units. And what do you do with the ones that don't want to go to the house? We, we, we keep trying. They're, they're, you can't force them on sex. It's like, what are you doing? Let's they're not violate the law. But you'll be, you'll be surprised. There, there's people that the first time they accepted the shelter, they go through the process of the break. I've been dealing with some individuals for 10 years, reaching out to them, or for six, seven years when I was in the civic center. And maybe for 50 years, they decided, you know, I'm, not I'm, done, I'm done with you, I'm done with your corporal. I'm going to do whatever you guys tell me. It, it's a process, and that's why we that's why we contract with, with city. That's why we have an actual mental health clinician from the county assigned the police department, so she can go out and reach. But we only got a three days a week. We've been asking the county to do a five days a week. They don't give to us, right? If she goes out, that's my my hardest, the hardest when it comes to mental health issues. You know what I mean? So it's it's there, but you know it's it's uh, so a lot of Indianism. Uh, nobody wants to have those services in their city, right? And Wait, so why should we? No, no, absolutely. You're not going to be an argument for me on uh, that one day. But like, we find this city's got a long way from, you know, like every city, if you would try to rest our way out, it doesn't work. And we've dedicated services to where if you call the call team, you know, and, and we respond to homeless individual, that guy's not going to be there when we leave. His, his mess is not going to be there when we leave. This, I just want to add the yeah. election happening on the 8th is very important. We have not been well represented by the county of San Ana. And in fact, my favorite person, I think, is zero. Is there a, a manager of homelessness or czar of homelessness in the county who has lots of HUD's funds, but they never seem to make it to San Ana? So that's why the election is very important that we get someone in there that will do that. 
We have a question back here. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, like, you know, I, I love to hear the comments and, and I really love, you know, like everybody, you know, that's the reason we're here because we all like to hear and we like to share because this is a family for me. But I can hear and, you know, like, I wish that everybody understand that if we, Santa Ana has the most, you know, accumulation of homelessness and nobody sees the reason why we are like this. We are the problem. We, the people, you never see, you know, like Newport, Huntington, you know, Corona del Mar. When do you see the people over there taking tamale, you know, like making good food for all these homeless people? You know, eat the bird. One day you see one bird, eat the bird. Next morning you see two. The second, you know, like that, and, and later you, oh my gosh, the three is quite a lot of birds. Why? Because you feed them. And that's the reason. If you know, like, I don't want to offend, you know, I love everybody because I'm so proud of police, uh, you know, like, the department. I live in Santa Ana for 48 years, and oh my gosh, like my son says, Mom, I take my sombrero and run a police guy because they really put their lives at risk for all of us to be comfortable. Santa Ana for me is like a, we have a big umbrella and it can rain, thunder, scaling, and we are so comfortable. Why? Because we have people to take care of all of us. I always ask for help and I don't have no problems with graffiti, trash. Homeless, because when I call, they always go and help. It says, you know, like sometimes, you know, we don't want the help immediately, like praying God, you know, I need this. But you know, the help, it doesn't come to our way. We have to wait in time because we are so many. We are so many. And we have to understand homeless people came here because we are the problem. We feed them. Go, sorry, sons, and you can see all the churches feeding all those people. They say, hey, guy, come here, we have food. Go look at those places where they have food. I will have lines go around the corner, way because they say, hey, let's go to the place eating food, and they pass the, the voice to everybody. And, and I used to have a brother like 10, 10 years ago. He, he was going to those places, he said, my God, they really feed us good food, you know, like a big bone, you know, like I can't buy those things. And I said, no, you don't supposed to do that. I have food here. But they have a good food. I said, no, go back to Mexico. If you don't want to work, come on, brother. Mm -mm. We don't come here to be like that. Uh, shame I do. If you go back to Mexico and I send them back to Mexico, then he stays there. <laughs> Never to tell you not to do something, right? But what we try to encourage is, is to get those meals and get those services in the shelter. We have that available for them in the shelter. And when they're in the shelter, they're going to get exposed to that environment. That part of the shelter is beautiful. It's incredible. The inside of that facility, the cafeteria, we got for them. And we encourage people to push that toward the shelter services. And we shelter. 50 to 60 individuals a month. Now you do that by 12 months. That's a lot of people that we, that we shelter. Now, is there recidivism where they come out? Yeah, obviously. But it's eventually, after turn, after turn, up, they're going to stay. And hopefully, they take advantage of one of our houses. I'm going to take another question here, and then we have some on, uh, online. We have a specific question. Hi, my name is Patricia. I have a question. Can you determine the, uh, uh, the social services? The company that is contracted that both you and the gentleman uh, mentioned earlier. Well, I I know that what we when they first came on, we had several companies come out and bid to do that outreach. Uh, there's nobody that does it as well as City that does. Some people maybe do, it, but nobody has the resources to do it, the amount of staff that they have. Uh, those those young ladies and young men bust their behinds. Working for us, but it goes it goes up to date from what I from what I understand. Okay, and who makes that decision? Is it city council? It's city hall. There's staff at city hall. Is that correct? Yeah. 
I don't think that decision. I just work with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. I think that would be the whole thing. I think that several people mentioned, like, are there other organizations? What services do they provide? And who, bottom line, if this isn't an effective, what we have now, okay, then as homeowners and residents, okay, then we need to demand better service. From whoever makes that bottom line. From, from, what I'm, from what I'm understanding, they're very new contract. The, the bar is being raised, there's more expectations of them, and response time is about it. Um, their calls for service when it comes to, to, to working with homelessness and stuff like that. But it, it's just not a blanket, okay, we're going to renew you next year. We'll be just evaluating the last six months, and then we're going to see what we can make it better before we renew this. But it's not so much the services, it's the amount of people that are dumped in the city. That's the problem. Right. Other right. cities are not taking the responsibility. If, if the police department can't resolve the issue because they may not be able to respond, okay, and we're all complaining that there isn't a response. Actually, then, actually, I should go ahead. Because I had two very positive experiences with that group. Uh, my wife and I were in this situation where homes were up and down the street. I called the police department, not knowing that there was another facility call. The police department said, Oh, did he look homeless? Well, I don't know. But he's acting homeless. So they referred me to the, the company. They, you know, they said, Who know? They said they would come out and, and try to handle the situation. They came out, unfortunately, the person refused. You know, one of those people that receives the services, uh, the company called me back and said they refused our help. We have called the police department for you. The company came over and took care of it. That happened twice. So I did have a good experience, but I think that's that's a symptom of treatment. We have to get to the cause here because this is going to be circular. We were here in 2016 when this ridiculous situation was happening at the county seat, <laughs> you know, down the court. On the floor. And uh, you know, well, the health department's here, all the facilities are here, everything's here, and I bring your people here because it's all here. Well, and I wasn't taking care of their people because they didn't have the resources, they didn't have a high health facility there to handle it. Newport wasn't taking care of theirs, they should be able to take care of theirs. That was a problem back then. Has anything happened in all these years? You know, in the four or five, six years since we were last having this exact same discussion. So I'm just curious. That's what I want to know. You so, said the home is down a little bit. That's the so, big yeah. so there was there was a lawsuit. I don't know, uh, Mike, you want to ask this because you're part of city managers. I just wanted to, to let you all my courtesy. I'm the community development director. Um, everything that's being said here is, you know, we were very upset when Judge Carter last Friday basically ordered the cold weather shelter to, to reopen. Um, two, two weeks ago, we all got together as soon as we heard they were taking it to the county supervisor's office uh, on, in a quick vote, something that wasn't even going to be noticed. Um, and uh, we started, we got on a conference call with uh, all their administrators and they're saying this is unacceptable. And so then we got together as a group and figured out, okay, do we have to go after Salvation Army? Do we have to go after the county? Can we file an injunction? And thank, thankfully the city attorney staff uh, uh, put together a good uh, proceeding so we could go and get in front of the judge. And we were successful at first, but then ultimately uh, uh, Judge Carter went and changed his mind and allowed the cold weather shelter. And it's not because the city council or city administration or police department. It's not that we're not caring and that we want people out on the street in the cold. It's that they, the county isn't doing enough to find locations in other cities, especially when they can put them in storefronts. So you can go and find a vacant storefront in another city, and they've done these type of cold weather shelter operations in storefronts. And uh, we still haven't been able to get the Judge Carter or others or the county to step up and show us why they can't open it in another city in a vacant retail or office in a storefront. And why so why not to appeal that case and go to another court? Yeah, I think we're probably at that point, and this is not for my decision to make, but uh, you know, 
we're at that point, I think, where you know we possibly need to go back and, and you know take it to another level uh, legally. So. Well, let me take it two ways. I don't know, uh, Jose, you want to jump in and say anything here? And Bill, and Jose, this is this is existing city business. Can you can either one you want to speak? That's, that's fine. I think uh, Mike uh, hit it perfectly. The fact is, is that yeah, we were all disappointed, severely disappointed when the decision was handed down. The judge did a 180 on us. I mean, a complete 180. I mean, the staff came away with good news. I'm sure many of you saw the press release that went out. And then to have it completely taken out from under us and to put it on us. And in talking with not, not this gentleman here, but another city attorney on our staff, what Judge Carter did was essentially say, well, it will take too much time to go to the other cities. How do you guys feel about that? So apparently we're the ones out here. It's okay, Santa, yeah, they can take it. But God forbid we inconvenience the other cities in this county. And, and what frustrates me more the worst is the fact that you've got cities in the north part of the county that have gotten together and they pool their resources and they've opened up shelters, they're building permits, supportive housing. But South County is doing zero. Not five, not 10, not 20, zero. And so that's the frustrating thing for us. So you've got the compound of the judge's decision to just basically say, you know what, it's okay to open up a cold weather shelter for the county to tell everybody. But we'll say council. Working with the district attorney here, so uh, with our lawyers, I don't want to go to the city, but with our lawyers, our city lawyers, why, why stop there? Why not appeal the case or take it to the next level? You're, you're not wrong, and we just got that decision. Yeah. We still, you know, city council is the way we work, we get together and we meet, and then we we'll open it. Well, no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna discuss it, but that's what I'm saying. So, this decision happened very recently. We have a meeting coming up Tuesday. We need to agendize it. We need to have that discussion. I 100% agree with you. We need to take action. I can't comment further than that because we still need to deliberate, but I share your concern. And since I've been on the council, I've been one of the biggest advocates to push the litigation because you know what? Our predecessors, they had conversations they went round and round with county and it went nowhere. And I think Carl mentioned that our previous supervisor I've never seen an elected representative would be so against the district that they represent, but he was. And we've had a caretaker supervisor for the last couple of months. She's been amazing, but she's a caretaker. She's not going to be our supervisor going forward. She'll be in another district. So elections are important. So think about that as you guys are marking your ballots for supervisor. But with that being said, to your point, yes, you're going to be definitely talking about litigation and what our options are. Because frankly, I will say for myself at one point, there were times I thought Judge Carter understood the burden that Sam Ann had, understood what we had done for the homeless in this county. And from what I saw or what I've heard from last uh, Friday, apparently not anymore. So there definitely has to be some change. We need to say a few words and we'll take uh, this gentleman's question here. So, sorry. Um, so back on April 25th, um, I believe the city had a a listening session over much like counting the state amounts about 10 million addressing the homes that was called. Um, what's the move with that? It was, like, it was like a really short amount of like three days and we got 10 people over the tenants. But so like, county, county did that, correct? County or state, they got like, I can't recall exactly. It was back in April, but it was either one or 10 million. I don't know, quite a bit of funds. I'm not sure what exactly is. I'm not sure either because the county doesn't want to give it to us. doesn't want to provide any resources for us. So I wish I could tell you what it is, but since they're not working with us to actually do something, better yet, you know who I wish you more than us? South County. I wish they knew more. I wish they could tell us where that money was going to actually provide resources down there. You guys can do a quick Google search. It's not like there aren't homeless in South County. They just somehow end up on the five. And drop off here. Why don't we do what they're doing in Texas? And instead of dropping them off in the Civic Center at 6 a.m., why don't we just have the bus go right down to when they go to Mission Video, when they go to Newport, when they go to Laguna Niguel, and just drop their off people off down there? Tim, Tim, I totally want to come, comment on that, but my city attorney is smart enough to tell me not to. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, when I was working for the city in 1986, the 
problems had just been beginning. So that's what, 36 years? So it's going to take us more than 36 years to take care of this problem because it's getting worse and worse. And I agree, it's because uh, Santa Ana had been taking the burden because we are a civic center and many of the resources and services to the homelessness, to the homeless people are provided right here at our center. And I agree with the young lady over there who said that because we provide those services, then more and more come. As a very good example, recently when I first came on the city council a couple of years ago, uh, El Centro Cultural was allowing people to live on the property. There was drugs, there were mental issues, we provided bathrooms, the city did, and the, if they were in mental state, they, they would tip over the bathrooms, break them, there was, um, they were uh, bothering the kids on to and from to school. They were sleeping on the sidewalk, breaking into automobiles. They were um, defecating in the parking structures and the garden. So this is the kind of thing that occurred because one agency, a Centro Cultural, at that time being run by Benjamin Vasquez, one of the candidates, allowed that. So we cannot allow that in city council is working together with other agencies, and we have been, we've never stopped. And so don't think that because you don't see anything going on that we're not, we're, that we're not doing anything with that. We don't care about. Actually, we do. As a matter of fact, there is lots and lots of money being put into it, and it's not the answer. We have uh, tried changing the hours um, when the people are released from jail, Instead of being released in the wee hours in the morning, we moved it up to about 11 p.m. so that they could take some kind of public transportation out of Santa Ana rather than being released into a civic center. That's one, you know, one area. We have also been instituted a great program, which is My Santa Ana, no, My Santa Ana app. And I can tell you that I use that daily. You know why? Because I have a huge homeless problem in my, my neighborhood in Ward 2, and it's right across the street from my home. And so every day when I get home, there's homeless there. Every day when I leave, there's homeless there. And I use my app, and I also call Sitting Net, and they do come and clean up and move the homeless out. They move the, the items that they, leave, that they leave behind. And it is working, but it takes effort on my part. And I will keep doing that. And I'm asking you for, for your patience and to keep doing that because eventually it will be cleaned up and we will have some kind of resolution, but it's not gonna happen overnight. We are working on it. And I guarantee you that these coming years, now that we have um, more resources and that COVID has allowed us to come out in, into the public, we can do more in the next four years. Santa Ana is going to be very aggressive and assertive in taking care of this problem because we cannot allow it. You put it. You put us in office to give you good public services, safe communities, a, a, a neighborhood where you can enjoy your home. And the homeless problem is not allowing you to do that. And so I promise you, as your elected official that we're gonna be working on that. This is a priority. And as I mentioned, it's not gonna go away in the next few years. It's gonna take a lot of years because it was created in a many years and we didn't do anything about it back then, but now it, it's gotten so bad that it's affecting every single part of our life. And, and we need to work together and we are working with you. And so- Thank you. Thank you. Let me get to some questions here. On the uh, internet. So we have a great question on Zoom. Uh, Herman asked, uh, what rights do I have as a homeowner dealing with the homeless person on my property? City attorney, do you want to ask? I think the judge. <laughs> so whether, whether he's homeless or not, he's not allowed to be on the property. So that, don't tap it, don't call city net, call the police department. If it's an emergency down now, you want if it's not an emergency, just sitting on your lawn, you call the non emergency number and let the police deal with that. And like I said, it doesn't matter if it's homeless or just some random guy walking down the street and we'll address it. 
It's now this is private property. It's a misdemeanor. So if you want that individual arrested, you will have to sign a private person's arrest form and have that, that guy arrested. All right, next one. A uh, question for the city attorney. Why doesn't the city request funds from the county to address mental health and addiction issues? Um, unfortunately, that that's not within the scope of the city attorney's office. It's more of a policy decision. Um, we will see, you know, the city attorney's here as a legal advisory capacity, so we don't make those type of things. And the third one, um, how many attacks by homeless people have there been wondering uh, what the crime level by homeless is? You know, I'll be honest with you, we don't get, at least I monitor a lot of calls for service when it comes to homelessness. We don't get a lot of calls where the homeless are actually physically attacked. We, we get a lot of calls where they're maybe, and a, a attack is in the eye of who's the one that's having the confrontation. We get a lot of homeless people that will be in your face asking you for money, asking you for food, that kind of stuff. Some people will consider that a physical attack, um, which is how uh, they see it, and that's, that's what it is. But the actual physical attacks, they're, they're pretty uncommon. From what I monitor, I'm trying to when I'm here working, I try to monitor them all day long. So we're not like New York, and we're not like LA, no, right? No, no, no. And, and I'm going to look. I've been doing this a long time, and you know, sometimes when I go to LA, I feel really good about myself. You know, <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that it's okay here in Santa Ana, but what what I will tell you all is that. If you're not happy with city that services, just call the police department and we'll come take care of us. Right? But just understand that it's going to be, we have our, our calls for service, our rent, and it's an order of priority. So it, it is what it is. The, the, the shootings, the stabbings, the robberies, those are going to take precedent over, over other stuff. Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions. Yep. Um, for me, or <laughs> the first one had to do with your issue about the laws changing. Is it still against the law to shoot up in public young kids? Absolutely. It is against the law? It is against the law. So when we call the police, they should come and arrest to deal with that individual, right? If, if we, yes, if we see the crime in progress or we find evidence of drugs or paraphernalia, they will be arrested. They should be arrested and they get a jail. And the police will come. They should. The other thing they have to do with mail. They have to see that. Is it still against the law to steal mail or packages? Absolutely. So the police will come and do something about that? Absolutely. We catch them. And how do you catch them? I mean, we have videos of them actually doing it, and the police didn't want to see them and didn't want to deal with it. So this is what I'd like to say. And that's more than just a homeless issue, the, the stealing of the mail and the Amazon packages. It's not always related to the homelessness. But what I will tell you is, what I will tell you is that as a police officer in the city for a long time, right? And I grew up with the whole community policing idea, and we're here to serve you. No matter how small we may think the problem is, we're here to solve your problem. If a patrol officer goes to your house and doesn't provide you the service that you're happy with, and doesn't give you an explanation of why he's making the decision that's taken, then you just ask for a supervisor and have a supervisor come out and let's figure this out. So my next question then had to deal with the manpower of these force. Did you feel that the police force is severely undermanned and can't answer all those calls? Well, you're going to get a nice question there because the more cops there, are going to be out of that thousands. <laughs> um, but when it comes to manpower, the, well, like Commander Marty answered that one, but you know, we're, 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 we're I guess we're biased on that, on that answer. Well, I'm not sure I understood the answer. Are you understaffed to respond to all those kind of calls? I don't think we're understaffed. We need some more police officers. And if they do come, they can act because it is against the law to be shooting up in public. Absolutely. So at 7 Eleven, where the line up with the curb shooting up. I just That's want to, pretty lovely. I just want to add something. So there's are there are many things that are against the law, right? It's not a law. It's not against the law to be homeless, but it is a law to be shooting up, to be using drugs, selling drugs, stealing packages, and we can have.
had enough officers on every block arresting those people, doing that every time, taking them to jail. But at that point, it's out of the city's hands, it's in the court's hands, it's in the prosecutor's hands, and that's where they can it's, in the, it's in the state law's hands. And they cut them loose. There's zero bail for these crimes. If you're, if you're people that are selling drugs before, you would think they would serve part time. Now they're being treated as. Um, you know, same as somebody that's just using or possessing. And those that are using or possessing, they're even treated as, as a less of a crime. So, I mean, I'm in court all the time, and I see that the things that the district attorney has to deal with, and, you know, they can't lock, they don't lock these people up, they don't want to go to treatment, they don't want to go to the homeless shelter. So, yes, it's against the law that the police officer arrested all these people, but then after it's out of this kind of the city's hand and it's we're kind of at the mercy of the courts on what they're going to do and the more and more the state keeps decriminalizing these type of crimes then that kind of that's what kind of he was saying that it's kind of out of the police hands at that point so what you're saying is if we did hire more police they still can't do much they can maybe arrest them but they can't do much with them because they get to the jail and then they get released well, right. Well, I know so I haven't heard a solution here. I heard a lot of concern about homeless shelters and food and how we take care of them and, and what we do with them. And I agree with that. I was homeless once. I know what it can be like. But there's a difference between just homeless and out to commit crimes. And a lot of these are committing. Crimes. Now, they might not be murders or assassinations, although other kinds of crimes are committed. But there is crime going on. But more police isn't the solution, evidently. It sounds to me like our laws are a problem in the state of California. Is that what I hear you saying? 100%. But even so, and we do have an election right now, right? <laughs> Please change Sacramento. Get them out. Get them out. Get them out. Let me address it. So when it comes to having more police, so you've heard the phrase calls for service and the responses for this, right? So what was already discussed was if you have a priority one, life threatening calls, sure. RPD has an amazing response time. It's all the other priorities under that that you start to see the, the longer response times. So when you talk about whether more officers or less officers would help, if they could actually respond more quickly, and you're right, we're not going to take the guy shooting up in front of 7-Eleven and put him in jail and that's it, we'll never see him again. But the fact of the matter is, when they're all hanging out, because in my board, I've got a 7-Eleven where they think it's just a grand place to hang out and shoot up. And you know what? Because our officers are playing whack a ball, and because of the number of them, they're not able to respond as quickly as they can. And so these folks start to get comfortable. They start to think it's okay to go ahead and shoot out, and so they're out there. So the thing is, is that while we're not going to see them, again, just taken off the street, put in jail, and that's the end of it, or taken and forced into some sort of rehabilitation, that's not happening. There are issues with state laws, but to say that we have enough officers, they, they should be put on the spot. I will say we need more officers. We absolutely need more officers. They should be put on the spot too. And I wish you did have more officers. But I do understand your frustration that when you go to do your job, nothing happens afterwards. And you gotta do something about that. And Make that's us. Awesome. We're the only ones that can do anything about that. And the election is like two weeks away, less than two weeks. We need to do something because we've done this to ourselves with the votes. We put people in charge of our state. That are changing our laws and letting this happen. And there's nothing we can do about it. We got a meeting going on here. How we're going to deal with all these problems. And I hear a lot of issues and a lot of problems, but I don't hear a lot of solutions because they're not at this level, except for maybe some more police to be there. <laughs> <laughs> So I was going to ask this question to you because I know it's an opportunity. Uh, what is being done about police uh, along with training for accidental 
Oh, we can't do that going over the train tracks. It won't be a train going like they used to. And if they do, the right over the next day. The man is thinking about what that I used to say all the time. He was like, now that you saw the Eddie River between standing and the railroad tracks. And it's just a mess every single day. It used to, it used to be that it was just a road. Uh, fault for doing it. Had a job to do it. And then uh, quite a while ago, when we were working in a code course, so it was uh, the city uh, had, had been given permission to place the lock. So what's happened with them because they're not really clean up anymore. Good question. So <laughs> Union Pacific is just like any other private private business in the city. They have tracks that run from Chestnut to Warner and they go west out to like the Carpenter, Susan, the Sunflower. And right now, they are allowing homeless encampments to build on their, on their property. Uh, the city sued them a few years ago, which required them to be response, to respond out there a certain number of times a month. Uh, they, they, they kept up with that. The tracks were looking better. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get some funds to the uh, Union Pacific Police to be out there and supervise their crews. We would send Santa a police officer out there to supervise their crews. That law, that lawsuit expired. Sitting at Union Pacific has kind of gone back to their old ways. If you've driven by the tracks lately, they had almost a no response out the tracks for nine weeks. They basically froze all their funding that they um, that they used to clean tracks all over Southern California for, for financial reasons that we get into it, but we're not. Uh, they wanted to have their books for the shareholders, basically, is what it now. And they made all the city suffer more than all the cities and counties. Well, that's not my decision, but that, that's that's up now. So now they're trying to play catch up. So now, if I push, which I do, they're here every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday to clean up the tracks. Monday and Wednesday is their actual actually in service because they service the uh, the bare paint facilities here in the city. They just, they just don't work on weekends. So it's we're out there, we're code enforcement now monitoring them and, and posting and finding when they can to get them to come out. So we're pushing on them. Um, we if there if you guys if there's a crime in progress on the tracks, you are to call the Santa Ana Police Department just to let you know. Don't call Union Pacific Railroad Police. They will take days to be out there and that's the only call for you guys. But if you're just reporting the campaign or graffiti or something like that, I think one of the flyers that boards back there has a way to contact Union Pacific. A lot of the businesses and residents in that area, I've given them the numbers for Union Pacific to call them directly. The more pressure you guys put on them, the more they'll come back here. There is a list of that that just want to say that who to contact in the city. Please pick a copy of it up. I use it live all, all, all the time. Let's see that question. Don't use Santa Ana after you get railroad Pacific miles. If something's happening, like with Edinger, like by maybe sometimes a go for the business and stuff like that, you can use the apps for that. But actually, on the railroad tracks, you don't have the Union Pacific because the more pressure you guys can have on them, the more they will come out here and respond to it because they're very negligent. Well, I think someone's ahead of you. We just sold multiple lines in the last few years that once we had a fire shelter and we had shelter beds that we were able to enforce the field that we just sold it in the app. Oh, we're on the word horse. And just not on the railroad tracks. It's private property. But is it that other cities are able to enforce the field in the railroad tracks? They should. Well, if in Tustin, Union Pacific doesn't run through Tustin, that's the metro. It's a whole different thing. And so those the metro trains throughout this county are throughout the city are pretty cool. But if you want to Anaheim where Union Pacific has tracks, they have they have major issues. With worse than us there. But it's private property. That's where we bring code enforcement into the mix to go out for them as a business because it's land use issue. You're not maintaining the property like if you own a restaurant or a business. You're still
still be right there. We're going to take the last question on, online. Uh, the question is, can our city council members request policy staff to look into requesting mental health and addiction resources from the county? No, we do. We do request it. In fact, uh, in talking with our staff, we've asked for certain specific uh, staff that the county has that they provide to other cities. So, so here's something where the county actually does provide a service, except it's not to San Ana. So they'll provide certain uh, clinical, I always forget the term, Sergeant Montiel, clinical mental health clinicians. Yeah, mental health clinicians. So other cities have multiple full time staff to handle that service or that particular aspect. We get one part time. So we get, we get one part time. So, yes, we would absolutely love to have more assistance from the county in that particular arena so that we can help those, especially those that you know, meet the diagnosis right there on the spot. Folks that are trained, you know, people are concerned that whether a police officers or right folks to be out there in the field are police officers. Not, not folks in the community, our police officers are saying yes. If the county would only give us these professionals to help us in our capacity, that would be wonderful, but they're not giving them to us. I hope that changes and I'll continue to advocate for it. But we do need that. And that's so to answer that question, yes, we, we've been asking for it. We'd love to have it. We'll see. One more thing I just want to dovetail on real quickly as far as resources. In San Ana, when we talk about shelters, right? We've got the county shelter, we've got the city shelter. We all know that warehousing people is not going to solve the problem. Permanent supportive housing. Housing, as was already mentioned earlier, with actual services on site. Think of it like a gym. If the gym is in your garage, God willing, hopefully you'll go work out. If the gym's a block away, well, depending on which way you go to work or school, you know whether you're going. If it's a mile, two miles away, you're less and less likely to go, right? But when you have, in their situation, you have services on site, you have counselors, you have trained professionals on site. That's how you're going to help folks. But the problem is, we can only build so much. We have over 400 units, permanent supportive housing units here in San Diego, more so than any other city in the county, right? So when anybody says, well, what's San Diego doing? We're doing all the right things to help folks, not just to say, well, the homeless, they don't like what they're doing, so we're going to try to do some enforcement or something else. We are actually doing things that professionals would say it's the right thing to do to help these folks. But again, Santa Ana cannot be the ones to do everything for all 34 other cities. So I would just, I want to say thank you to, you know, everybody that has been supportive of those initiatives. I want to thank our staff that's here today because, because of them, while it may seem like there's not enough being done, I mean, as, as Sergeant Montiel mentioned, we are seeing reduction in homelessness, but we're also, unfortunately, as you get rid of some of the folks that are accepting service that are moving on, now you're left with a really hardcore service resistant, the most criminal element that's out there. So uh, I want to thank our staff for what they do. Um, and I know that we're not close to being done with this, but there's a lot of things that we need to do. We do need to push on county lawyers. We are. We are. We are. Oh, sorry about that. So yeah. Thank you, guys. I got one last question. I'll let you uh, ask it. My question is uh, Sergeant Montiel, you had mentioned that. The I guess the parameters of a lawsuit against Union Pacific expired. So my question is, Mr. Deputy City Attorney, why do we not go back and refile the lawsuit? Do it again. Wash, rinse, repeat. Work before. Initial step that the city usually takes to try to mediate an issue, and from there, you know, it's progressive enforcement until, and then if that doesn't work, then we kind of exercise all our legal options. So, so well, what Union Pacific is not doing what they were, what they agreed to do in front of the judge. Why not call them back in front of the judge? Well, let me jump in. So, Tim, they didn't get in front of the judge. They came to us and said, "Please, pray, please." Let's not go to court. We pinky square. We're going to actually be good this time. We're going to clean up our stuff. We're going to maintain our property. What was it? Ten days? Fifteen days that they were able to do it before they they um, reneged on the promise. So they haven't been good actors. They've been very challenging to say the least. 
what, what our assistant city attorney is talking about as far as steps to be taken, they're taking them. But I would say, and I'm saying this, I think we do need to take more drastic action. I think we do need to hold the butts back in the court or hold them into court. No more pleading with them and seeing if they'll maybe do, what, 20 days this time, 25 days? No, we need to get a firm agreement that they're going to do their part. As Sergeant Montiel already mentioned, we've been catering, we've been trying to work with them, we've been offering assistance where we can to their staff to do what they should be doing regardless. But you're right, I think we do need to ratchet it up, we need to take the, the next steps. But I would say right now, as far as what we can do, uh, our staff is doing it, but I don't think that's enough. Again, it's not their fault, it's just there has to be, how should I say, there, there needs to be firm direction from the council. And I can assure you that I'm definitely there for it when it comes to moving forward, but I'll, I'll leave that discussion for the session at a later date. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. We have two more items to cover real quick. We honor time. That detail is a very good topic. We have, and I really want to thank the panel for all the questions and folks in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very well presented. And I, I, I we appreciate this fair exchange. I do ask uh, Commander Martin to second very patiently. Never talk about my alcohol. Sir, you are your students. Uh, yes. Okay. Stand up. Everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. yes. So the PAL stands for Police Athletics Activities League. It was formed in the early 2000s by an officer who had a vision to develop an after-school program for our city's youth. And so we started the Police Athletic Activities League, which is specifically for our children, uh, and it's an after-school program. And here's the focus. The focus is academics first, which we tell them. And then tutoring if the students need that tutoring. And then moving on to exercising programs as well as athletic programs, whether they want to play in their softball league, in our running team, our brand new soccer team that's coming, our three versus three basketball team. We, have a, we actually have our own athletic league within our program. It's been so successful where it's been at 2627 West McFadden that there was a, a demand to expand. So we've expanded currently to the Powell Roosevelt Walker Community Center off of 816 East Chestnut, right on the corner of Chestnut and Standard. So now the children from the Roosevelt Elementary School now walk, I would say maybe 30 yards from their school property straight to the Roosevelt Walker Center where we partnered with Parks and Recreation. It's their building, but we partnered with them. They've given us a classroom to expand our programming there to the students within that area. We've also been blessed to have 625 South Cypress, thanks to the council support, which our council members thank you very much, and for the community support that night at that meeting to give us that facility that will be a PAL program for that area, that immediate area there. That is where we're going to, for the first time ever, have senior citizen programming during the day. And then once senior citizen programming is done, after school hours, 2.30, 45 ish that's when we'll be ready for the kids to start the after school program. We'll also have a police officer workstation. What a workstation is, is where it's a location where officers can come, take their breaks, use the restroom facilities, work on the reports in their area versus having to come and leave their area, let's say for the Southeast District, they come all the way to the station to do the reports. We put a workstation at the Powell Roosevelt Walker Center. So those officers, those area officers can be in their area, taking their breaks, having team meetings, or working on their reports. They just left your house with a report, they can go to that safe location, still be in their area, still be available for calls and service, but they're in that area. What that does, we talked about it earlier, that increases response times because we're putting, we're allowing officers, we're giving them an area to take breaks and do their reports in the area where they're assigned. So moving forward, what our vision is, is to also start implementing PAL programs with officer workstations in our parks. The first one we're looking at is gonna be the Santa Anita Park because there's other areas throughout the community 
and just be patient with us, but there's areas within our community that need, that the youth needs this after school program. We wanna be able to take the kids from school, off the streets, into our hands for an after school program working on their homework first, then sporting and athletic activities. And then once they're done with us, they're home, mom and dad's feed them, they go to bed and the next day, a new day starts. But the, the biggest thing is taking away the kids off the streets, taking away the recruitment opportunities from our local games. That's what that's what our number one mission is. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just want to say, PNX, Commander Marty and I have been, so I have talked about this intensely, but that is such a touchy subject and special to me because my daughter was killed about two blocks from where they just opened that center. So, you know, you can't help but think if those kids weren't recruited by those gangs, you know, what would the outcome of her life have been different? So I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And that's our number one mission is to create a safe haven for our children in our city. Okay, uh, that that they won't be exposed to the gang element, and that we'll, we'll be creating a future. And don't mistake me; we're not trying to make police officers here. That's the career path they want to take. Okay, but we want to be able to create a safe haven during this time of their age in their life, to where they'll be able to achieve the dreams that they want to achieve. But by having the support, and most of the actually all the coaches, I think Coach John Logan was an actual police officer, spent a lot of his time doing narcotics enforcement. His gift now is artistry and programming. And he's the he is the unbelievable gift behind this program and its expansion. And so that's what we hope to do is to continue expanding this program so more families and more youth, more of our kids in this in this community can experience that wonderful actual program that's being so successful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it. We'll be meeting again on November 18th. And just before Mayor Day meets John Costco again. I just want to say, I just want to say oh, one last thing. Do you one last thing. I says, don't give up. Don't give up. And we're still together as with the real men who want to stop. Right. Uh, Do you have an announcement? Yes, you have a class real fast. Okay, announcements. I know all of you and all of us are concerned about our kids in Halloween, okay? This Saturday on uh, the 29th, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, which is in Santa Ana, okay, is having a huge outreach called Glow on the It is free. We're going to have a petting zoo. You're going to hate us because we have candy galore. We have bounce houses. We have, I'm doing popcorn with green hair. So I want to see you out there. But it's from five to nine, it's Saturday. The kids can bring their costumes and so forth. And it is a very secure place to bring all your kids. Last time we had, last year we had 4,000 community people with their kids at this event. So we invite you all to come free, heading to lots of food, lots of candy, bounce houses, face painting. You'll have a great time. I'm going to see picture of the degree here. We have the drawing for the right here in front. I want to thank Terry and Grant for bringing it to us. And before my man started to draw us, he said, Yeah, I took a beat. Yeah. Before he draws it, I asked him a birthday kid and went out to see That's his dad's, what, 153 years today. That's when the land uh, was bought to be up downtown by a service was purchased in the situation of San Antonio. So tonight is our birthday in San Antonio. Happy beer. Oh, Sergeant Montiel. <laughs> oh, Michael, too? Oh, that's all right. Michael? Hey, Michael? Yeah. You can be present with us, but you should have to see him. Yeah. Like a number. Number. Number is not that true.
Jews are by Judea Penalis and Judean. Holy Spirit. Liz Shipman. I can read that. 383128 for you numbers people. Liz Shipley. Oh, she went to her ship. Ah, she can believe it. See ya. Go on again? Yes. Maybe Sergeant Montiel. Sergeant Montiel. Andrew, is it Remus? Is that right? Three eight three one two two. Check that kick. <laughs> okay. I forgot to tell you.